For visual artists, working together is unusual. Not unheard of, but it is unusual. Art is a field that prizes above all the idea of singular creative expression. Yet we have still chosen to work side by side, and it has been an interesting journey. Of course, working in collaboration doesn't just apply to making art. It can apply to your own endeavors and passions as well. And it can be with anyone or more than one person. It doesn't have to be a spouse, but simply another individual that you can learn to trust and to respect as you meet a goal together. Well, you may be thinking about now, I'm not so sure I want to do this. Or perhaps, is that collaboration thing truly a worthwhile possibility for me? All we can do is share our own experience, our own story, but we think we have found an answer. And in the hearing, perhaps you will too. I'm an artist. And I'm married to an artist. Jill and I met in freshman drawing class and just like that, four years later we were married. We were young and naive about a lot of things, but one thing we were sure about was that we would always continue expressing ourselves through our art. We would always be artists. Now most, if not all, would agree that art is a means of self-expression, which implies that only one person one self at a time is doing the expressing. Many artists are fine with this, at least the visual artists, I think. But of course not all, certainly not those in the performing arts. Our symphonies, our ballets, our theater, and our film, all are the results of incredible collaboration. Of writers, poets, composers, and the majority of visual artists almost always work alone. And it is the way Jill and I made art for years. Despite sharing a home and a life together, when it came to being artists, we were each on our own. But is it, does it have to be this way? Is this the best way to create? Isolated from any distraction, confined within a studio? Yes, it's true. We were just kids when we got married and we didn't know what our lives would become. All we knew, I guess, is that we wanted to do it together. By which I mean, do everything together, but make art. That was a separate thing. That's something we did alone, or at least for many years, it's what we practiced, and that's what we thought. That is until about 15 years ago, when we were asked to do something we really wanted to do, but felt totally unqualified and unprepared to do it. We were asked to be part of a group from our church that was going to Brazil for a few weeks. They were going to provide support for a mission effort there. We wanted to go, but what could we contribute? We didn't speak the language, and we were certainly not missionaries. But then we remembered who we were. We were artists. So we packed up our art supplies and we painted in Brazil. And it was awesome. We discovered we might not speak Portuguese, but we could communicate, and best of all, we could do it together. It was then that we truly understood that art really does transcend language, or better said, art is its own language. Our experience of painting together over the past 15 years has been both rewarding and fulfilling. We've painted over 150 times in public settings, and many of those have been in a religious context. From these experiences of working together in a live situation, much as we are doing today, it began to sink in that our old way of making art in isolation, this was missing something important, a sense of a shared vision. So we made a deliberate change and we began to purposely figure out how to make art as partners, as a team. This new way of thinking soon led to a fresh body of work in various gallery shows. We equally contributed to this new work, but in a studio rather than before an audience. And through this process, we learned some things. We realized that individual egos and preconceived notions needed to be put aside. We were familiar with dialogues between artists and the work, 
but it had now become a three-way conversation between Jill, myself, and the painting or sculpture we began to create. A conversation that inspired us to be more confident in our ideas and more ambitious in terms of scale and complexity. So I suppose to answer Jack's question, does making art need to be a solitary process? Is that the only way to be creative, to be the best that we can be? For me, the answer is an absolute no. But I think I should qualify that no. Because admittedly, it can be more challenging and more difficult than working alone. Not always, but it can be. It requires lots of give and take, compromise, sensitivity, and especially the need to relinquish control. After all, you are more than one person, and these additional eyes see things differently than you do. And you will have to deal with that, I guess. This reminds me of a drawing exercise we both do with our students. Both Jack and myself are art teachers. He teaches at a university level, and I teach at the high school level. The exercise involves beginning drawing students that use their own hand as a convenient and always challenging subject to render. In our instruction, we mention it sometimes helps to shut one eye to observe their hand up close. Each of our eyes sees something slightly different than the other, and this overlap, this double vision, can be confusing to a beginning drawer. But for us, this double improved vision is useful and desirable. Who among us would sacrifice an eye for ease in drawing? Two eyes provide us with so much more insight into the 3D nature of this place in which we exist. Who would want to be like a workhorse with blinders that restrict its field of vision when there is so much more to see? So no matter how much more challenging and difficult working with someone else can be, this collaboration, this double vision, can be ultimately the most rewarding thing you will ever do. At least, it has been for us. Several of our most renowned Renaissance artists were said to be loners. Some were downright secretive. Michelangelo kept his in-progress ceiling under lock and key as much as possible. And for his sketchbooks, Da Vinci even devised a way of writing backwards to obscure his ideas from prying eyes. These men were artistic geniuses, yet I can't help but wonder how much more they could have produced with a little less self-reliance and a little more assistance and cooperation. At his death at the age of 67, Leonardo had produced only 30 paintings, indeed incomparable masterpieces. But in contrast, Raphael had completed over 60 paintings before his death at the young age of 27. A striking difference that can at least partially be attributed to the fact that Raphael was said to be loved by all, a people's kind of person, who employed a myriad of apprentices to assist him. And then there's Michelangelo. Despite living to the ripe old age of 88, working alone, he sculpted less than 40 marble sculptures while Bernini and his assistants created over 90 sculptures, fountains, and artistic wonders that transform to this day the face of Rome. So it seems working with others, sharing talents, and even ideas on occasion may at the least increase productivity, and at the most feed creativity to an extent unimagined by the singular artist. To quote Oliver Wendell Holmes, Many ideas grow better when transplanted into another mind than in the one where they sprung up. We believe mutual respect is essential when working side by side. There can be no concerted artwork without a shared trust and a willingness to allow one another to make artistic decisions and mistakes along the way. Setting the ego aside and allowing communal creativity to flow is paramount. Have you ever had a best friend growing up, one so close that you would speak the same thoughts at the same time? Well, that's not totally us, but almost. We do have different ideas, unique characteristics, personal styles, and specific talents, 
but we do work well together, and together we are better than each of us alone. We often receive comments after painting in a public setting. That is besides the confused viewer who asks, what exactly is that? There are other kind souls who are encouraging and often even include the comment, how do you know what to do when? You seem so practiced, so, so coordinated. More than once you've been told that when we paint, it looks almost like a dance. Which by the way, we love as we grew up in extremely conservative religious families. Jill in California, myself in Texas, and neither of us attended our high school proms. I guess our upbringing viewed dancing as a very suspect activity. But today is a different time and a different age. And even the Pope, Pope Francis, not only danced in his youth, but especially loves the tango. In fact, for his 78th birthday, thousands of tango dancers helped celebrate in the plaza outside St. Peter's Basilica. The tango is a dance that is sensuous, vibrant, and playful. It is rich in mutual expression and improvisation. It's said that when it arrived in Europe in the early decades of the 20th century, it was the first dance for couples in which everyone on the dance floor was not in sequence, performing every movement simultaneously. It allowed for self-expression or perhaps partner expression. It even changed fashion and perhaps even contributed to the demise of the corset. It was just a little too binding for some of those movements. Yet sadly, the truth remains, Jack and Jill Maxwell even to this day, still can't hit the dance floor. At least not with any grace, finesse, or confidence. At least somehow, some way, there's comfort in the feeling that perhaps, just perhaps, our brushes and paint dance for us. To move together without thinking, it can take years of practice. Still, there are missteps and clumsy attempts at something difficult but often not. After 36 years of marriage, we do have the practice. Malcolm Gladwell states in his book Outliers that it requires 10,000 hours to hone a skill for it to become second nature. Ask any professional athlete or actor or musician. As a couple, we have far more than 10,000 hours together. So consequently, we sense each other's moves. We think alike but not the same. So together we paint and we dance without really dancing. We make marks, we react and respond to those actions, but especially we trust each other as any good dancer must trust his or her partner to lead and to follow and to always be there with support. To always be there, to always provide support. That's what relationships are built upon. In a world that grows more crowded each day, and yet at the same time much, much smaller, we need relationships that work. We need trust. And we need to get along. In any way, really, who wants to dance alone? Life is so much better when shared. Yes, it can be less spontaneous and sometimes less convenient. It takes practice and commitment. So our story's about done. You decide. Is collaboration a worthwhile possibility for you? For us, it's a yes. The effort is worth it and the benefits are huge. Perhaps in this world, right now, Double vision is exactly what is needed. To share your eyes, your unique perspective that life has granted you. So take those first awkward, clumsy steps together. Step on a few feet at first. But you soon should hear the music and with someone alongside you, join the dance. <laughs>